I'll introduce myself. I am Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, giving my 27th lecture of 36 lectures. Today's lecture is called Psychic Inflation and Deflation. Just so you know, next week is the November 23rd, there will be no lecture the day after Thanksgiving. We resume on November 30th. Jung coined the term psychic inflation, and I joined it to its opposite term, psychic deflation. This pair of opposites is our subject today, because each is a continuous danger to anticipate. Last week, we discussed the continuous danger of self-strangulation or choking off one's own voice and validity that results in psychic deflation. Today, we discuss the continuous danger of psychic inflation. As I remarked last week, noting the empty seat, uh, to my, always to my right in these lectures, this is where Shakespeare sits. He, he's listening. And we will come to, to see what he has to show us in his best play, Hamlet, about this is our subject. He's our teacher for the day. Then I will conclude the lecture, as always, with a case to get practical. Now you can surely recall any day in your life as a doctor here, or as a staff member, in any capacity. One moment you say something unexpectedly brilliant, and you're inflated to double your normal size. And, I, and then Soon to follow, you say something un unexpectedly stupid, and you are now deflated to half your usual size. And so goes the day. Now, to show this in Hamlet and to show this in a case, I need first to tell you about what is beyond what Bateson calls learning one, which means getting one's memory right about a single situation. Simply said, we are all in continuous danger of having the wrong map of what we walk into. Sim, uh, each of us has, has misplaced cells in his or her hippocampus that fire when something's out of place. And for example, uh, which will trigger search behavior. So if a squirrel uh, is in shock that it can't find the nut it, it, it buried last fall, a misplaced cell will fire and it will go in search behavior. Each night, the same thing that the squirrel did during the daytime is rerun, and the same for us. Um, and it recalibrates the memory map. It puts it, it solidifies it in the memory by rerunning it. As Edelman would say, we reweight the memory map by rerunning it. That's how we do it neuro, neuro, neurologically. In the High Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas wrote that the memory map. Um, that men need, men and women need images to understand. So he said they need pictures, say, of how to get to heaven. And so he drew memory maps for them and, and instructed his, his church to do that. And then there, were, then there needed to be, and that's called the Ars Ascendi, and then they needed maps of getting back to earth. It's called the Ars Descendi. Cecilia seemed to know what that is. Um, to be ready for the ruthless powers on earth that will give psychic inflation to some and psychic deflation to others. Only as you get older and experienced enough do you begin to consider why these things keep happening, not just occasionally. Rather continuously and everywhere you turn. I mean the entire series of power relationships in, in which might makes right. This is because power relationships and beautiful exchanges are always getting mixed up. Who could be clearer about this than Homer? Dante, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, who reads them? Me and Paul. These are the greatest teachers of what I call the third and fourth lines of sight. To me, indispensable. By the third line of sight, I mean the capacity to remain undecided about anyone you have dealings with. As Edelman would say, everyone has many loops which re-enter from their histories, and some are mutual and beautiful, and some of them are are about capturing supplies and could be quite ruthless. Having gone around some loops of beautiful exchange, you can get lulled into false security and get yourself in danger. A fourth line of sight is to be ready for how suddenly this happens. 
Weather and relationships can shift in one second from one loop to a different loop. In other words, the third line of sight is to know the whole musical score from beneficent to maleficent. Spatially, across a full set of opposites like hot to cold, wet to dry, sweet to rotten, and so forth, in the myths of South American Indian tribes. That's, that, those were their, their myths were their maps. We have to have our own versions of this. And the fourth line of sight is to know the score in the moment. Knowing, knowing the score, but not in the moment, you're helpless in the suddenness of its playing out. All right, now we get to Stephen Booth's essay on the value of Hamlet, um, which now will be the center of the lecture. And I will play Hamlet, get to play Hamlet four times for you, since I love to act. This, this is a pleasure I've given to myself. Um, so you remember from high school, Hamlet's the play in which Claudius uh, murders Ham Hamlet's father and usurps his throne and takes over his wife, Gertrude. And Hamlet comes back from the university and is in this rotten situation. So uh, Stephen Booth's essay comes in three parts. Part one lays out the fundamental opposition in every sentence between Claudius and Hamlet. Claudius is lying in every sentence by conjoining things which do not go together. Like, but now my cousin Hamlet and my son, Hamlet, a little more than kin and less than kind. The first thing spoken by Hamlet and the first thing spoken aside to the audience. With that line, Hamlet, I'm quoting Booth now, though, with that line, Hamlet takes the audience for his own and gives himself as its agent on the stage. Hamlet and the audience are from this point in the play more firmly united than any other such pair in Shakespeare and perhaps in literature, in all of dramatic literature. Part two begins of Booth. The play persists in taking the, its audience to the brink of intellectual terror. Simply, Hamlet never lets anything stand. Every conjunction is a disjunction. Everything seems. Seems is the operative word. Thus, uh, Hamlet's so-called friends from the University of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern sent for by the king to spy on what's up with Hamlet. Hamlet says to them, were you not sent for? Is it not your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, come, deal justly with me. Nay, speak, Guildenstern. What should we say, my lord, Hamlet? Why anything? but to the purpose. Yeah, you were sent for. Part th three explains how the audience can bear its own terror at this kind of thing. Students of the play, Booth says, students of the play whittle it down to one of, it, one of its terms. Truth is bigger than any one system for knowing it. Hamlet, uh, and Hamlet is bigger than any of the frames of reference uh, it contains. Hamlet refuses to cradle, and that's a very beautiful word, cradle its audience in a closed gen generic framework, or otherwise limit the ideological context of its actions. In Hamlet, the mind is cradled in nothing more than the fabric of the play. You guys are learning this. It's amazing. See why I almost became an English professor? I am now. The superior strength and value of that fabric is in the sense that it gives that it's unlimited in its range and that its audience is not only sufficient to comprehend it, like you're comprehending this, but is in the act of achieving total comprehension of all the perceptions to which the mind can open. Is this lecture too hard? I don't think so. Thus, in one example of this fabric of reversals and contradictions of terrifying opposites, one after another, throughout the play, we are to be cradled in. Hamlet comes in upon Claudius, his uncle, who has murdered his father, praying for forgiveness. He comes up from back behind him and exclaims to himself aside, to aside, in other words, to the audience, his chance for revenge. Hamlet, now I might do it. Now tis a praying. And now I'll do it. And so I goes to heaven. And so, I am revenged, that would be scanned. A villain kills my father, and for that, I, his sole son, 
do this same villain send to heaven? Why? This is higher in salary, not revenge. The source of the strength is in a rhetorical economy that allows the audience to perform both of the basic actions of the mind. I bet you don't know what they are, but this is what Booth says upon every conjunction of elements. It perceives strong likeness, and it perceives strong difference. Those are the basic actions of the mind. Thus, the following example, here's a, here's, here it is uh, with uh, Hamlet accosting his mother. We're going to do this on time uh, for marrying the creepy murderer of his father. And he shows her a pair of small paintings of each and exclaims, this was your husband. Look you now what follows here. He's showing the two photographs, the, the two brothers. Here is your husband, like a mildewed ear, blasting his wholesome brother. Have you eyes? Could you on this fair mountain leave to feed and batten on this moor? Have you eyes? Learning to, now, learning to is the full set of any pair of opposites. Um, so Claudius, you know, pretending to be close to Hamlet, Hamlet saying, we're not close. Rosenstein and Gilsenstern saying, we're, we're your buddies back from university. Hamlet says, you were sent for. See, that's, that's one pair of opposites. That learning to then means all the episodes of that, of, that, of that pair of opposites. Learning three is the full set of all the pairs of opposites that constitute the fabric we are cradled in in order to contain our terror. For example, we, we went from, from murder, you know, Hamlet about to murder Claudius to, I'm not sending this, this that's going, that sends him to heaven, I'm not doing that, right? Here's, here's, here he is with the mother saying, you know, look what you had, you know, look what you took, right? Have you, have you eyes? So how do we learn to see like this? Without... Uh, the South American tribes you know, have their myths of all, of all the opposites. Well, we have them. We have Shakespeare. We have Tolstoy. We have Dante. You know, we have the big, the big fellows. Without such an education to recalibrate our memory maps when they misplace us, we will continue to be susceptible to erratic success that puts us into psychic inflation. And we will be vulnerable susceptible to erratic foolishness that puts us into psychic deflation. We are no better than our full set of memory maps. And thus we are truly cradled in their fabric. But the alternative is Shakespeare's favorite word, which is to be deceived. Men were deceivers ever, etc. Right? Now, uh, I'll give you an example and then we'll, of, of myself as is struggling with psychic uh, inflation and deflation. My wife were out and I were out at the cabin that last beautiful Indian summer night, uh, weekend before last, uh, talking about our dreams. And I told her about this dream, yeah, that I had at 4 a.m. I dreamt that I was, um, we'll keep it here, Ed. We'll go to the whiteboard in a second. I dreamed that I was age 17 in high school, visited by the Harvard tennis coaches who to recruit me. Um, they meant no mistake about it, for they already had a book of photographs showing me, you know, doing all the strokes, right? <laughs> and they were, I, I, was, I was about to sign on the dotted line. My father said something really rude to them, and then my mother did, and then I did, and then they abruptly took back their book of, of uh, photographs of my playing and, uh, and went, out, went huffed out the front door. Okay, now we'll go to the, the uh, whiteboard at the end there. So... Um, now, um, this hologram on the left, this picture's my, that, that, you know, a really good athlete, uh, a tennis player or a baseball player who can hesitate in midair, or these Harvard athletes I saw watching their, their football team a few weeks ago, they get these guys that, that can, you know, from Asia and Africa and China, you know, they're 200, 280 pounds, they can run sideways, backwards, forwards. I mean, they're incredible. So... In the, in the dream, you know, these kind of athletes have this natural transitional capacity, right? Then they go to Harvard. What happens there? Well, um, then, there you, you run into the danger of psychic inflation, where, 
where you think you're you're really you're really important. So you're a very very good athlete and very fresh as an assistant professor. By the time you get to be a professor, watch out, you'll be an empty throne of glory. Lots of them are. A few manage not to be. So you get sucked into into the whole hierarchy of power. All right, we can return from the whiteboard. All right. So the last paragraph or so of the lecture. Finally, my wife and I discussed Sunday morning out at the land what this, what this had to do with me. Uh, and, and I always have it when I, I always have another uh, revision of my memory map when I'm wrong, when I get into psychic inflation. And I was into psychic inflation on, on Friday and on Saturday. So this dream, uh, I will show you how it works to set me straight, right? So I don't remain quite as stupid. All right. So I have to be careful I, when we recruit students. I'll run into med, you know these medical students, and they'll know a little bit about some subject, and I know like a hundred times about it. So I have to try to keep the relationship symmetrical. I, they say one thing, I say something. Well, one of them annoyed me, and I started telling her a whole lot about about a certain subject. I, I was just so pissed off with myself because then <laughs> because then I didn't learn anything, right? And and. Uh, so, um, so I have to, you know, and the same thing can happen to me on the tennis court. On Saturday, I thought I was going to knock these guys right, right, right through the backstop, and they were very clever, and I, they won. <laughs> so I recalibrate my memory map that was painfully wrong in several domains. We're going to get here. Asymmetrical relationships of power, one party high up, the other party and inflated the other party down low and deflated are a continuous danger to beautiful and symmetrical exchange. On the other hand, unequals can be made equal by the restraint of the stronger party. Thank you. <laughs>